Many of you know, if you've been here before, uh, the Dean Speaker Series was created to bring to our campus outstanding scholars and leaders from a variety of fields, including business, education, and government, to share their insights and thoughts with UNC Keenan Flagler, including our faculty, our staff, our students, and also we're always happy to have uh, members of the community at large uh, who often join us for these events. The Dean Speaker Series is made possible through the support of the Archie K. Davis Endowment and is managed primarily by our students who select and invite the leaders they are most interested in learning from. Tonight we welcome Steve Howe of Ernst & Young. And I'd like to welcome and particularly acknowledge all of the Ernst & Young employees who have joined us this evening, particularly all of the UNC Keenan Flagler and UNC grads who are at your Ernst & Young. And I'm about to embarrass you. So if you were an alum and an Ernst & Young employee, will you please stand and we're going to give you a hand. That probably demonstrates as well as anything the strong partnership between our two organizations. So thank you all for, for coming. Uh, I'd also, and I will not embarrass you because you're not students yet, but I also would like to point out that we have a number of prospective MBA students who are here for the Inside Keenan Flagler weekend. And how about if y'all would just raise your hand? Would, did you do that? All right, there they are. We'll give them a hand. Thank you. We are very pleased this evening to have Steve Howe join us. Uh, Steve is America's managing partner of Ernst & Young. Ernst & Young is, of course, one of the big four professional services firms, which offers tax, assurance, transaction, and advisory services globally. In the Americas, the company operates in 30 countries through 13 business units. Uh, these units and the firm's centralized infrastructure in the Americas all report to Steve. He also represents Ernst & Young in maintaining regulatory relationships and as executive sponsor for inclusiveness. Steve has been with ENY for more than 25 years, having served previously as audit partner and senior advisory partner on many of the firm's largest clients, including, deep breath here, UBS, Morgan Stanley, Walmart, NASDAQ, American Express, General Motors, and Citigroup. Some large responsibilities to say, to say the least. Uh, he was previously managing partner of one of the firm's largest business units, the Financial Services Office, from 2000 through uh, June 2006. Following tonight's speech, John Hand, H. Allen, Andrew, Distinguished Professor and Associate Dean of the Masters of Accounting Program here at UNC Keenan Flagler, will offer a vote of thanks on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students. Uh, a bit more background, Steve graduated from Colgate University with a BA in Mathematical Economics and also the Stern School at New York University with an MBA in Accounting and Finance. He's a member of the Board of Trustees of Carnegie Hall, the Board of Trustees of Colgate University, and the Leadership Board of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Center for Capital Markets Competitiveness. Steve, his wife, and their four children reside in, Ple reside, excuse me, in Pleasantville, New York. Please join me in welcoming to Keenan Flagler, Steve Howe. Thank you, Jim, and uh, it really is a pleasure to be here. It has been a spectacular day. I asked, is the weather always this nice here? I may come more often. It uh, was quite rainy and cold when I left New York. Um, I do visit some campuses, uh, a few each year, some of our priority campuses in particular, but I can tell you this really is a distinct place. I've been to Raleigh before uh, with Bob and others even earlier this year, but never to the campus here, and uh, I really have had a wonderful day. Thank you all for rolling out uh, the light blue carpet. <laughs> and I'm glad I was told to wear a light blue tie as well. I felt a little bit uh, out of place without light blue socks and <laughs> belts and other things, but. Uh, <laughs> I. Um, would tell you this as well about this campus and it and the amazing people you produce. Uh, that's become more clear to me today. Uh, the students, many of you here, just so bright and energetic, the questions you ask um, and the way you present themselves. And I can tell you I already knew that because uh, Ernst & Young employs, last count, 183 of you students, former students of UNC. Many of them stood up 
just recently and others are doing great things for our firm around the country, around the Americas, and around the world. And uh, the dean used the word partnership. That's how we view it as well. Uh, Ernst & Young believes it is a terrific partnership and one we intend to continue to be invested in. One amazing thing about our team, these Tar Heel members at Ernst & Young, is they have an instinct on how to grow a business. And uh, when you consider that they're trained here on this campus, that's not surprising, I think. Watching the way you are educating your people, to me it seems like Chapel Hill is really a boiling hot greenhouse for innovation and entrepreneurship, things that are really important to us at Ernst & Young. And especially this campus, I think, and its MBA program. You see, you know, you're ranked at the various, very highest levels uh, on your focus on entrepreneurship. I've seen it in Entrepreneur Magazine. I've seen it in Fortune, the Princeton Review, Forbes.com. And we know, because we watch these forums as well, that recognition does not come out of nowhere. This school really does have a firm commitment to building businesses from the ground up. And starting in the classroom, I think you build the tools your students need. You have that in your MBA concentration and the undergraduate concentration in entrepreneurship as well. And you boast a lot of extra programs, extracurricular programs focused on entrepreneurship. These include the Venture Capital Investment Competition, UNC's Carolina Challenge Business Plan Competition, and the Carolina Launch Program. And uh, as you might guess, I'm going to speak a bit more about entrepreneurship because right now it's more important than ever in this economy. And what you're doing here at UNC is precisely what you should be doing in continuing your focus there. Like other great universities, others too produce and attract great business minds, great young minds uh, to be developed. And often they come back to share their insights. And, and this is what got me thinking again about some similarities we have, Ernst & Young and UNC. And there really are some similarities that focus on, on this very issue. Many of you students might think um, that what we do, what Ernst & Young does, is focus on our clients. And that's true. You think we focus on audit and tax work and transaction work and advisory services, and you're right there as well. And structuring complex transactions, these are the things that Ernst & Young does. We help businesses do these things and more, become more efficient and effective and manage their risks. While we do all that, though, and we do it very well, frankly, in my opinion, that's not what we are really all about. Ernst & Young is increasingly recognized as a market leader. And when I think about Ernst & Young, some of the things that are resonating in the market right now are these. Globalization. You know, we have believed for some time that we must be the best global professional services organization. And the economic collapse we've lived through in the last year has demonstrated very clearly how global the economy is. Ernst & Young is increasingly being recognized as that, the most global. Second, our focus on our culture and our people. You know, just like you read Forbes.com and others to see how they view you and what you're focused on, we're thrilled to see how these same organizations view the culture of Ernst & Young, what kind of a place it is for people to begin and launch their careers. Third, we think we're very strong, and the market increasingly sees it in execution. Execution, execution of our priorities, focus on our clients, focus on the marketplace, pure execution. And fourth is this subject I've been mentioning already, entrepreneurship and innovation. And I really do see that we share a common passion for and commitment to entrepreneurship and innovation. Ernst & Young and UNC. So today, I really want to share some thoughts on this theme, entrepreneurship and innovation. We are intensely focused on entrepreneurship and innovation every day at Ernst & Young, and we have been for decades. And I know this same focus is really critical today, more than ever, 
not only in this global economy, in this country, but even in this region and right here. And so what I'd like to do is talk about these subjects, and then I would love to take some questions on these or any others from you. Let's acknowledge that talking about economic growth and opportunity right now is not easy and can be pretty risky. It sounds far off to some still. This region knows well the pain we're seeing across the economy. It has been a very tough period, and this has hit companies and households and individuals very hard. There is no doubt that the economy is still very rough out there. We've seen dramatic layoffs, unemployment, at least reported unemployment, already at 30-year highs. Businesses are still holding off on hiring. I think this will continue to be an issue. Companies have cut back, become more efficient, and even as things begin to return, they realize they need to stay focused on efficiency. And we've seen the twin engines of this economy, the credit markets and the consumer sector, hit a wall over the past year. Some people look at this and say the glass is half empty, most definitely. Others might even say, where is the glass? I would tell you this, I think the glass is more than half full, and I have some perspectives to share on this, particularly in times like these. I entered the workforce in 1982-83. It was actually a time similar to this when unemployment rates were at their peak. But more importantly, it didn't seem like we were ever going to get back to being the world's economic engine right here. Pessimism was enormous. I was lucky to have a job. Many others told me that. It was hard to look forward with confidence at that time. Things, as you know, did change for the better and changed pretty quickly. Now, years later, I spend much of my time talking to entrepreneurs and innovators, and they are absolutely the best kind of people to talk about what will turn this economy around and how do we get businesses growing again. And here's what I'm hearing. It's actually a great time to be a fresh thinker. Some people really see this as the best time to be a risk taker, to think about how to move ahead, to be an innovator. This is exactly the kind of period when entrepreneurship and innovation will thrive. The dirty secret of recessions we find as we study them is that they actually wake people up. Large and small businesses are totally remaking themselves. This is happening on a global level. The winners are going to be those that transform themselves. That means greater innovation in big companies and small. It means challenging existing business lines, thinking about where new opportunities may lie, capitalizing on emerging markets in, in this country, in this region, and around the world. At EY, we are focused very much on strengthening during these times. We're watching clients who are simply trying to get through these times. We're watching others who know they will strengthen during these times. And we believe that that's exactly the road to pursue. Now, I wish I could tell you that the innovation and entrepreneurship I'm seeing translates immediately into stable jobs, lots of opportunity, return to stability across the board. Unfortunately not. That's not the way the economy works, and all of you in this community know that it has generated great pain for many. But we are starting to see those sprouts coming out of the ashes. People are starting to innovate, and when you see innovation, opportunity most definitely follows. A few weeks ago, I sat down with the editors of Business Week to talk about what we, Ernst & Young, are seeing in this economy, and specifically about these subjects, entrepreneurship and innovation. We shared perspectives from around the globe. Entrepreneurship and innovation has been, for many years, what America does best. You see, Business Week is studying this subject because they believe entrepreneurship and innovation is the key to us moving forward, coming out of these doldrums. And the other thing that was gratifying to me was that they recognize that Ernst & Young 
has been a leader in serving entrepreneurs for almost 30 years, in focusing on our Entrepreneur of the Year program, in recognizing the power of entrepreneurs and the, what they bring to this economy. Now, on this campus, in this setting, it's easy to assume that all the necessary support is there for entrepreneurs. And there are some fantastic success stories. We can all point them out. The Research Triangle among them and our own Entrepreneur of the Year winner in the U.S. last year, Raleigh's own Matthew Zulick of Red Hat, won the whole thing in the Americas. Now, I recognize what Matt has done at Red Hat, creating a business model out of collaboration with customers. I want to say this, our economy does not have enough success stories like this. This is a real issue for all of us and the political dynamics to be focused on. We don't have enough red hats. We need to encourage it, and we, need, we surely need it in the years to come. On a national basis, the U.S. is not doing enough to create a sustainable class of entrepreneurs. Let me share you a few statistics on this. The Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF, it's headed by Robert Atkinson, and it recently published a report using 16 indicators to examine the innovation-based competitiveness of 40 nations. In the top five today were two Asian nations, Singapore and South Korea. The U.S. was ranked sixth overall in these 40. But amazingly, the U.S. was ranked last in the 40 on progress made towards an innovative economy in the last decade. That means that in recent times, the other 39 economies are closing the innovation gap on us here in the U.S. China, by the way, was number one on that basis. Now, it's true that the U.S. still leads the world in absolute innovation. We've got, in fact, still an enormous lead, built up over several decades. But others are catching up fast, and others surely know as well what I'm sharing with you, that innovation is crucial as we move ahead. In a recent Harvard Business Review article, John Cow noted that China, currently the world's center of outsourced manufacturing, will be the next hub of brute force innovation. Think about that phrase for a minute, brute force innovation. That means China will be, will be moving from being the world center for call us when you want to do something cheap to potentially becoming the center for call us when you want a lot of the best ideas fast. Did you know there are 50 car companies in China now? Think what that kind of competition is going to mean for automobile design and quality. Let me paint you a picture of what innovation looks like on that kind of a scale. In China, not too many years ago, the rural poor cooked their meals on highly inefficient and dangerous stoves not too long ago. These were energy guzzling devices that were bad really in every sense of the term. So over the course of a decade and a half, China distributed safer and cleaner stoves to 185 million households. Decided to fix this in one decade. That's like giving away a stove to every household in the United States and then millions more into Canada startling, but it shows you the power if they get focused and where they could go. Now, I'll be the first to say that such examples are more brute force than innovation, the example I just shared. But it does show you what can happen when you turn the massive resources of a highly motivated and rapidly growing and far-thinking society to any challenge. And if the challenge is developing an innovative culture, innovative business model, if they really see that as the way forward, I can assure you the Chinese will figure that out fast too. That doesn't mean we'll be left in the dust here. 
far from it. In fact, we hold a commanding position in entrepreneurship precisely because we don't plan it. We don't try to control it at the state level. We try to enable it. We don't permanently tag some of our students as innovative and others as unable to innovate because we know from hard experience that some of the best ideas will come to those who weren't maybe trying to think of them. We know that great ideas can also follow great failures. We know that great ideas emerge from unlikely settings and sometimes unlikely people. We know innovation, therefore, needs to be broadly encouraged. We can't pick the individual who will come up with that great innovation that will move us forward. We need to broadly encourage it. And that is particularly important in these times. With the balance of my time today, I want to share with you four critical ingredients to innovation that we see in today's economy. First, innovation fundamentally is a byproduct of human capital. In global information-driven economies, what matters most in starting up is actually not capital. It's not large factories. It's not even large teams of people. What matters is fresh thinking about sometimes all too familiar problems. You know, let me go back to Matt Zulick again. He said something recently to me that really struck a chord. He decided early on that in software development, the value of putting intellectual property into the public domain, moving to an open source model, would carry significant advantages. More customer involvement in shaping the product, building a simple distribution model, and creating a truly unique relationship with clients. And this is what Matt said. And I quote, people thought that was the dumbest idea they had ever heard. Really, he would talk to people, talk to financiers, the dumbest idea I've ever heard was often his response. Continue the quote, no one had ever done it before. Imagine trying to build a business around free. But it worked. Matt said, most of the people who develop our product don't work for the company. And in that trust and through the power of collaboration, it has allowed our organization to achieve unimaginable results in the face of the greatest of competition. This was an innovator told time and time again, stupid, won't work, won't happen, and we the competition will crush you. But look at what happened and look at what that has become. It takes a great mind to think of such a business model. But in this case, it took many great minds for him to get rallied around him to make it happen. Human capital. Second, innovation takes teamwork. I know there's a popular image of scientists working alone in a lab, toiling away. Those are the great innovators figuring out tomorrow's solutions trying to find one thing after another until they have that eureka moment. Some really believe that. We work with some of the fastest growing biotech and high-tech companies in the world. We have dominant market share in Silicon Valley and have for decades. And I see it up front and I know this much. Those labs and offices are full of people exchanging a lot of ideas. It is chaos out there in these buildings. If you're looking for peace and quiet, these places, trust me, are not for you. And something else about these innovation teams, there's not a lot of room for ego. We spoke to one Czech software developer recently, really a bright guy, and he said this, look, maybe some time ago, I was one of the best programmers in all of the Czech Republic, but now I know I'm not. Now I have to hire young, smart programmers, and they're much better than me, and I'm not bothered by that. The third key ingredient of innovation I call guts, especially now. Think what it must take to start a new business these days. 
Besides the challenge of getting access to the credit markets, still not very easy, the challenge of signing up new customers, the challenge of making payroll, the challenge of meeting all those local, state, and federal regulations that are out there and proliferating. Just imagine what it must feel like to step away from what one might be doing right now, a more sure thing, the decent job with existing salary and benefits, and decide to risk it all. Talk to entrepreneurs, those who have succeeded, and they will tell you that's precisely what they love the most. They think these sort of bleak moments in economic history are actually the best times to step out on their own. And you know what? They're right. We've looked back at this, and we estimate that over half the companies in the Fortune 500 were started during recessionary periods or periods of significant economic weakness. And let me tell you again, these periods will not last long. Entrepreneurs understand that when everyone else is running for the exits, there's a lot more room to operate, to show off your smarts, and to win the lasting loyalty of your customers. And we see that in every market, in every market in this region and around the world. If you want to look for the winners of tomorrow, go look at the startups of today. And that is why Ernst & Young has been focused on this space, because it's smart business for us. We serve, for example, today Google and Apple. We started with each of them when they were no more than a handful of people in their garages. The fourth and final thing I wanted to share with you is what I call inclusiveness. And let me take a few minutes to explain what I mean by that. You have a unique opportunity here at Chapel Hill. You're constantly interacting with people from different cultures. I've been sitting around tables all day long each one a group of different cultures, different backgrounds. Some of you spoke different languages as a first language as you grew up. Some of you came from a different continent altogether. All of you have very different perspectives from one another. Bottom line is this. Diversity surrounds all of us. Every school, every company, every organization today in every way. We believe that it is the responsibility of each one of us to learn from the others. That's when diversity becomes inclusiveness. And inclusiveness leads to better answers and a better business. Let me give you a sense of this. To serve a large client today at Ernst & Young, you have to form relationships even internally that literally follow the sun. You need to get to know a team in Asia, understand emerging markets in India and China, interact with colleagues in Europe, focus on business expansion down here in Brazil. Interact with your diverse team also sitting right here closer to home. This is a reality that did not exist when I graduated from college. But today, woe to the organization that seeks to compete on a global level with a provincial team. You simply can't do it, certainly not effectively. So inclusiveness is not just about being diverse or being unique. It's about putting that diversity to work, about getting everyone's unique perspective to the table and contributing. What should this mean to you, students of UNC, well, whether you pursue a career in finance or accounting or something else altogether, I want you to know that your intelligence and your skills will take you far. But what will truly help you stand out is the way you approach problems, the way you bring fresh perspectives, the way you take your creativity and your experiences and everything that makes you who you are to the table. Your individuality is critically important. Make sure you do leave an impact where you work and live, at your office, at your home, in the communities where you reside and do business. 
at Ernst & Young, we spend a lot of time discovering what makes our teams, our best teams, highly successful? And how do we keep creating a winning culture? And we are recognized at being pretty good at this. Our experience tells us that steady, sustainable success is realized through this inclusive mindset, commitment to values, and real teamwork. And you need all of that working together. I stress inclusiveness even more so because we are coming out of a period of economic challenge, unprecedented, a crisis never seen before, precisely because, I think, a lot of people did not act on their suspicions, did not speak up, didn't bring their unique perspectives to the table, or perhaps they were never even at the table to begin with. As future managers and leaders, make sure you have a variety of viewpoints and experiences at the table. The dean shared my background at Ernst & Young, and it is largely in financial services. The heart of the problems we've all watched unfold in the last 18 months. I served major Wall Street banks for years, and the one thing I saw firsthand looking back is that industry got stuck in groupthink. It filled its management with people who were really bright, but only thought of the upside of potential investments and never really focused enough on the potential downside. These were some of the smartest people I have ever met, but they didn't have the experience or perspective of someone who really valued thinking through the downside, thinking through the risks, putting in place risk management, not in enough places. They thought alike, they acted alike, and as a result, they and we have suffered alike. Truly innovative people in inclusive teams were not burned by that collapse of the credit markets. There were some teams out there who saw the whole field, opportunity as well as risk. Their innovation included seeing the downside as well as the upside. And that, I am sure, took guts in conference rooms across the globe. To have someone listen to them, that also took inclusive thinking, someone willing to listen to a different perspective. And it meant recognizing a good, smart idea when it appeared and not dismissing it because it wasn't in line with everyone else's thinking. Now, I think my time here, probably running down, I'll do what your professors tend to do, I'm sure, or at least what mine used to do, and that is to try and summarize. I talked about the importance of innovation to the future of our economy, more crucial than ever, and I focused on the four qualities of innovation that I see as universal. The importance of human capital, the importance of teamwork, the importance of guts, and the importance of inclusiveness. And if you look at these four qualities, they may be familiar, and I hope they are, because these are four qualities I see you focusing on right here on this campus. You have to be smart to be here. You have to work well in teams. Teamwork is all over the billboards. Right in front of the, even the, the Dean Smith Center I walked into today. It's not the back shirt, it's the front shirt. You have to trust also your gut and be willing to test ideas when everyone is petrified of failure. And you have to value the talents and perspectives of everyone around you. So to me, you are already on your way to becoming successful innovators in your own right. You already have a tremendous platform. Your grounding is set and you have tremendous potential, and you can achieve it. Consider the sky to be your limit and go reach for that sky. Thank you very much for your time and attention.
be happy to take some questions. Can I? Yes, sure. Um, I actually got some great questions from some of the students today who were asking for advice as they launch a career. And one of the things I shared with them were two or three instances in my career where I was open to something new, open to a challenge. I think sometimes we, we anybody good at what they do, teaching business, has got a plan in front of them, thinks they know where they're heading, and might be presented with a, a different approach, a different idea, a different alternative. And I talked about a couple of cases in my own career where I actually started in the media and entertainment industry, which I loved, and then was asked to move into financial services. My first reaction was, why would I want to do that? Um, my second reaction was, this is a pretty senior partner asking me to think about it. Um, but ultimately, I, I did move in that direction and spent over a decade in the space. Um, I also, the second example I shared was I, I was really fully intrigued and, and excited and satisfied with client service and then was asked to move into a management role, uh, which was not something I, I really had on my radar. These are simple examples which happen day after day after day in our organization and anywhere. You'll be presented with opportunities do the hard work that's necessary, you know, to, to get yourself recognized, to be viewed as a good performer wherever you go, and then be open to those alternatives that will present themselves. Yes. One of the, uh, the real common themes I see in entrepreneurs um, is, is first passion. I think that people like take a Matthew Zulik. I mean, great idea. There's lots of great ideas out there, but he was so passionate about it, people wanted to follow him, even if they too thought it was a stupid idea. <laughs> but, you know, it really, I think it takes somebody smart, somebody who knows he or she needs to build a team, needs some help, needs some resources, lays out a vision, is passionate about it, is inclusive about including others in going after that vision and doing so in a passionate way. And, and that's a common theme I see among entrepreneurs. Yes. Yes, I, I think uh, the questions about China and a very good one, that some are still concerned about quality in China, um, what kind of a market it is, and, and we have some of those concerns as well. Just to give you a sense, Ernst & Young, uh, a $23 billion organization in 148 countries, put last year aside for a moment, in the two preceding years, we grew an average of 40% per year in China. Um, we grew globally at about 8 to 10% in each of those two years. 
Um, things were moving very fast. Uh, things were moving probably too fast. Quality is, is not always um, point one. They don't have the same regulatory oversight, whether that's you know, manufacturing, FDA, banking, financial services. But all of that, I think, they increasingly understand and are focused on it. And that's why I use the, the stove example. This is a country, I think, that is going to continue to deal with their problems and deal with them quickly. Um, they still have challenges in the energy and, and environment uh, out there as well. But what we're beginning to see, and not only are they dealing with those problems at home, they're also beginning to take their business on the road. I've been visited in the last year, um, and I really can't recall any time before the last year being visited by Chinese companies coming into our markets, wanting to be investors, maybe recognizing that you know they will buy up some businesses over here, which already have figured out the quality controls they need. They're also very interested in South America, uh, Chinese companies very focused on Brazil. So I think they are solving problems at home and going to globalize their business, not just by building it in China, but by understanding how things are done in the Western world and, and drawing from that as well. Question over here, yep. That is, um, that is true. I think that large companies out there, sometimes we don't see enough innovation because they're protecting an existing business. Um, that's where I think, that when I go back to what I, what I said about companies today. Some are trying to just hang on, manage costs, get through this downturn, and thinking perhaps we're going to return to normal. Maybe normal was 18 months ago. I think the best companies, big and small, are seeing that it has now changed forever. They must reset, they must restructure, they must innovate. Um, I've heard GE, for example, Jeff Immelt, you know, challenge his entire organization. Uh, we need to do the same. You know, we are hearing from our clients, you know, there's fee pressure across all of our businesses. What is your audit methodology? How do you provide tax services? You know, are you using resources uh, around the world? Um, what, uh, what costs are you passing on to us? So I think every company, big and small, needs to know that they need to be in reset mode, that our existing businesses are all under challenge, global competitors are emerging, the economy is coming back, these sprouts, but not returning to the strength it was at two years ago. So I think uh, leaders need to work through uh, that reluctance and, and push all of their people to think, think more vigorously about the future. Yes, right here. Well, I, I still think that we and you um, here in the, in the university system of the U.S., I still think that we have the best. I think that's why um, others from around the world are still coming into the system here. Um, but I think we need to continue to innovate there as well. Um, I do worry very much about our education systems below the university level. Um, and, and whether or not, well, I think one of the big unknowns and potential concerns is the pressure that state and local governments are going to be under in the years to come. You know, as we begin to come out of this, how much help was stimulation, how much help was Fed policy, and how much of an overhang do we have? And if that's big, you know, that's going to hurt us in terms of, you know, rebuilding infrastructure, rebuilding education. Uh, at lower levels, and my fear is that it is potentially big. You know, you look at some of the pension plans that are out there in the public sector and whether or not we really have diagnosed the extent of the problem yet. 
So I share your concern that um, we do need to revitalize uh, things like education and infrastructure in this country, um, and I worry about whether we're going to have the funding to do that. I wish I could give you a more positive answer on that. Yes. Um, the first thing, my first piece of advice, I, uh, I really do think that there was regulatory uh, letdown here. I, I think that our regulatory system, not surprisingly, it was, it was born in 1930. Um, for the capital markets and financial institutions which evolved, I think our regulatory system is badly outdated and was not in a position to comprehensively regulate the financial sectors. I thought that that would have been dealt with swiftly, um, and I'm concerned that what's happening is that there's a, um, right now, a lot of self-protection going on and causing, I think, the original energy to really put back on the table regulation um, I fear is going to end in an answer that is, you know, no more than tweaking the edges as opposed to a comprehensive relook at regulation. Take insurance, for example, as well. Insurance is still regulated at a state level. Um, we've got companies doing business not only globally, certainly across state lines. Um, we had credit default swaps falling between the cracks. And so I think you're right. Innovation did happen. Um, it was within the rules and regulation. There were not adequate capital requirements uh, that were put out there. So that's where I would start. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to see comprehensive re-regulation. I think the question of um, are some of these institutions too big, we are seeing uh, some of that is being attacked now overseas. ING, which does a lot of business down here in the southeast, uh, is being forced by the Dutch regulatory authorities to break itself up insurance, asset management, and banking. I think we've seen small changes here uh, in this country, but I think that will continue to be studied. Um, I think I'm, I'm of two minds on that because I've dealt with, you look at companies struggling like Citigroup and, and you make that argument. Um, I look at a JP Morgan, which, which was exceptionally well managed um, through this, has absorbed a lot of integration is running business across all those sectors and actually ended up being a good thing uh, in this collapse in a position to take on failing institutions like Washington Mutual and Bear Stearns. So um, I would start with regulation and then I would study the, uh, the institutions. Just to break them up in the middle of the regulation we're looking at, I fear would, uh, would not necessarily lead to the promised land. Yes. One of the things that, um, that we need to do, and this is a fair question, that um, if you look, many of the big companies seem to be on their backs, and um, are we really going to expect them all of a sudden to innovate and find their way forward? Um, I think some will and some won't. Um, I think we're a big company too, and this is something we need to focus on. One of the things we're thinking about is how to tap in to the generation joining the workforce. You know, all of you with new ideas and different ways of thinking, different ways of communicating. How do we reach them? Should we have our own Twitter at Ernst & Young? Um, how do we capture your ideas? You're out there. You know, we've got, as I said, 40,000 people in the Americas. We probably have 20,000 under 30. 
um, at least, and, and we need to do a better job of, of capturing their imagination, their ideas, um, and we're thinking actively about that right now. I think um, I think what what we believe and what I think some of our clients are, are, are doing is is sometimes you just have to shake things up. I, I think sometimes changes need to be made um, in people, in organization structure, um, in in philosophy. I think and and some of that people get set in their ways and sometimes as try, try as you might you cannot convince this department led by this manager to begin to do things differently and um, I believe this is a period of time for big organizations where, where some change is, is fundamental to moving forward and some of that will be to create efficiency some of that will be to create imme immediate competitive advantage and some of it will be just to shake things up just to put in some new and fresh thinkers to get people focused um, on thinking differently about the way forward. One more? I know you got a ball game to watch today too, right? <laughs> One more here. Well, I think that as I look at the globe and where people are focused, where different markets are focused, I think the question over here about financial services is an important one. I think that we should be embarrassed about the performance of financial services over the last couple of years and the questions that were raised about how we were running in these industries. Having said that, the United States has dominated the financial services sector forever. And I think, you know, it is long past when we will dominate on a global basis manufacturing, for example. Doesn't mean we're out entirely, but we're not going to be the world's manufacturing leader. So I, if I were this administration, would be figuring out financial services, how to make it operate again so that that service sector continues to be dominated by the United States of America, which has the reserve currency, which has the intellectual capital. I'd also stay focused on technology, which again, I think is an industry that we can dominate. And then I would move towards probably climate change. Um, talk about China, they'll be racing along. We will figure out climate change if we're serious about it before they do. We'll figure out how to do business in a sustainable way. Our young people want us to. Um, I think that th that's where I would lead, one, two, three. Thank you very much. So my name is John Hand. I have the privilege of uh, heading up the Master of Accounting program. And uh, one of the things we do at the end of our talks here is uh, extend a vote of thanks. And I think there's a couple of things I'd like to mention about Steve's talk that really resonated with me and hopefully with, with you as well. One was the uh, partnership that we have as a business school with Ernst & Young. And that's been especially the case in the Master of Accounting program and looking back, looking now and looking to the future, we really appreciate uh, that relationship. The other aspect was entrepreneurship, and, and I think many people don't necessarily think about faculty as being entrepreneurs, but that's a real big part of our job. Our job is to generate new research ideas, to teach in different ways and innovate in the classroom, and also in our service opportunities. So at least that's something that resonated with me, and hopefully you will find that out as, as, as students here at the business school. So I hope you will join with me, please, in extending a round of thanks 
to Steve Howe. Thank you. One additional round of thanks to Steve is that we normally provide a gift to our speaker. And uh, Steve generously said, rather than us give him a gift, he would like for the resources that would have been put to that gift to be provided to the Master of Accounting program. So thank you for doing that. We uh, will take and use that uh, set of resources uh, for the benefit of the program and the students. Thank you very much. That's the conclusion of our time here. Steve will be sticking around the front if anyone would like to come and ask questions and uh, provide comments. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Steve.